thank you all so much for joining again in this panel. Uh, so in this panel, we'll hear a bit about the Academy uh, or a bit more because you already heard a bit in the beginning. Uh, in this, we will uh, speak to some of our fellows. Um, we don't have them here because they are from around the globe. So we have them online. Uh, we also hear from uh, data.org on uh, the workforce wanted report that they have uh, created specifically for social impact organizations. We have uh, our trainer uh, mentor representatives, both from CMotions and from DHL, uh, who have uh, extensively supported our fellows, uh, not just during the training programs, but also one-on-one uh, -on -one mentoring session. So actually they are just representatives, I would say, because I think a lot of your colleagues uh, also put in a lot of time and effort uh, and uh, yeah, they are representing them as well. And then of course we have Claudia from our team. She's going to talk a bit about our thought process while designing and also some of the feedback that or learnings that we have from the Academy. Um, First, we'll have uh, Joanne. She's a project manager of uh, strategic partnerships at data.org. Uh, Joanne, are you here? I am here, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Joanne, over to you. Thank you so much. And you can share your slides. Yes, do you see? I'm sharing my screen now. Can you see them? Mm, not yet. <laughs> this one? I think it is. Yes. Can yes. you move just to check? Yes, yeah. perfect. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, as Pravati said, my name is Joanne Jan, and I work in strategic partnerships at data.org. And I spend most of my days thinking about how can we increase the capacity of organizations and the social sector at large to use data more effectively. So just a quick uh, context setting for data.org. We're trying to address the problem that the social sector and social impact organizations are lagging behind in terms of using data and data science effectively. Um, we believe there's three main buckets as to why they're lagging behind. The first being awareness, the second being skills and experience, which is something that analytics for a better world is trying to address. And the third is resources. So having um, limited tools and capability to share data effectively and broadly. And so data.org strategic approach founded in 2020 is really thinking about three things, shaping the narrative, uh, showing what great looks like in different cases, cases, capacity by strengthening the, the sector, by working with different partners and partnerships, empowering people and organizations to build capacity in terms of data. And then third, thinking about transforming the commons. So creating shared public resources for anyone to access and use. And something that I know is um, a foundational for, for a lot of work thinking about data talent for social impact is a report that we created uh, in partnership with Patrick J. McGovern Foundation that surveyed the current state of data talent. And what we found in this landscape report was that there are challenges that the social sector face, um, both immediate and big picture. So we found that there is potential to add 3.5 million data for social impact jobs over the next 10 years, specifically in low and middle income countries. This is only if the, pop, the sector itself is properly, properly stimulated to um, create these jobs and accept these jobs. And we also recognize through this landscape report that the values of inclusivity, diversity, equity, and accessibility, IDEA is what we call it at data.org, have to be core to this work. So we identified in the landscape report four pathways forward. The first three pathways are thinking about expanding the supply of data for social impact professionals through the existing and new talent pathways. The first one is new talent, expanding exposure of learners through the development of DSI use cases. This is thinking about hands-on practical learning, incorporation of applied learning into curriculum, stronger alignment of training models with the needs and demands of the nonprofit sector. The second pathway is thinking about existing talent. So what are the models for upskilling and reskilling, such as in-house or outsourcing or sponsorship models? This recognizes the value of existing talent committed to social impact in social impact organizations. And the third pathway is transitional talent. So this is thinking about greater exposure and access to opportunities that allow for more agile flow of talent across different sectors. So perhaps someone in the private sector would move into the nonprofit sector. 
Examples to um, think about here are hands-on fellowships, short courses, volunteer opportunities, et cetera. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we're thinking about increasing awareness and the capability to absorb uh, data talent in social impact organizations. And the main and final pathway is leadership. So how does leadership enhance and shape new models to support the design, experimentation, advancement of data-driven strategies, initiatives, and talent acquisition? So to sum up, to meet this demand, data.org is committed to building a coalition of academics, funders, governments, and social impact professionals to train 1 million social impact data practitioners over the next 10 years. In parallel to the global workforce of uh, purpose-driven data practitioners, we also must build up organizational capacity to be able to intake this new talent, which is why data.org created the data maturity assessment or DMA for short. This gives organizations a snapshot view on where they are in their data journey and resources to help them grow their data practices. Um, so a quick overview of the DMA, it's made for social impact organizations, philanthropies, private sector organizations, and academic institutions. And the goal is that the assessment serves as a communication tool within your organization to share progress, align on areas of opportunity, and also to chart a path forward in your data journey. Uh, the DMA is built on this data maturity framework, purpose, practice, people. Uh, very briefly, purpose, purpose is thinking about uh, what do you want to use the data to do? Practice is thinking about you de you've determined the outcomes with the data. How are you going to go about achieving the outcomes? And people, the talent that you need to carry out the different data strategies at your organization. And I'll just round out with a couple screenshots of the DMA. I just want to mention that it's straightforward. It's easy to use with clear and concise questions. And perhaps most importantly, it has useful, usable results. So on this next page, you'll see that the tool um, will automatically spit out a results page like this right after you submit. And below it, it's not captured in the screenshot, but below are tailored resources based on your responses. And finally, this tool was created by the community for the community. We engaged with SIOs all over the world um, to create something that is purposely um, directed towards social impact organizations and helping them figure out where they are in their data journey. And so that's it for me. If you want to stay in touch with data.org, feel free to subscribe to our newsletter. And my email is joanne at data.org if you want to continue this kind of conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Joanne. Actually, when we started uh, Analytics for a Better World, this Workforce Wanted report uh, launched. So it was actually used also by us as a framework when we designed some of the programs of the Academy. In addition, data.org also did a workshop for our fellows on the data maturity assessment. And uh, many of them uh, found it really useful because they could get a clear picture of how uh, across people process technology, what kind of investments are needed and where do they stand. Uh, but we didn't make the data available to, the, uh, to others. So they were able to see for themselves but they wanted to see how it is spread across organizations and they found it a very useful tool. So yeah, it was uh, really thanks to Data.org that they were able to support the Academy. So thanks, uh, Joanne. Uh, now, um, Claudia will tell us a bit about how we used uh, this plus some other resources to come up with a curriculum for the fellowship because yeah that's the first time we have been doing we did it but there were already a lot of programs out there uh, for data science but we wanted to tailor it a bit for more for nonprofits. so Claudia will uh, take us uh, through the journey thanks over to you Claudia <laughs> so uh, yeah so I'm Claudia thank you everybody for being here so yeah, as Parvati mentioned, we had the opportunity and the nice uh, challenge to develop a program that will suit not only a diversity of NGOs, but also a diversity of uh, people and experiences, and also how mature were they in their journey into data for each of the fellows. So first, it was the challenge as well of uh, understanding what possibly can we offer that they don't already know. And in terms of data, I think we uh, 
uh, had this key understanding of what is feasible. So let's uh, work on uh, how to teach content that is possible to apply to in their context. So that was, was, was uh, one of the main things. And then we had uh, three parts uh, of the program. The first part was very general. So we wanted to cover all the bases. So we had uh, basics on Python, on, uh, on project development, on how to work for the sustainable development goals, for example, and what is it? So very general for everybody. And I would like to also say that the amount of applications that we got was also not only difficult to go through all the applications because of the amount, but also because of the quality and the diversity, not only geographical, but also in terms of what kind of problems they were bringing to the table and how interesting they were to work uh, with. So we really tried to keep a balance from the 300 plus application that, that we got uh, to reduce it to 40, 40 people, 43 people to be exact, wasn't easy, but we wanted, okay, a balance of projects, but also a balance of uh, people and gender as well, because we are we are also dealing in, in the nonprofit sector with uh, imbalance in terms of uh, gender. And we wanted to be aware of that. So the first part was general, let's cover all the bases, uh, including machine learning basics, also uh, artificial intelligence that is not, you, we cannot cover in one uh, two hour course, but let's have at least uh, the main idea out there. And then we had a very nice dive in into a specializations that I think by that point was also nice uh, for the fellows to have had that opportunity in general to decide also what do I want to learn more? Uh, what do I want to dive uh, deep into? And then they had the uh, opportunity to decide either uh, to take machine learning or geospatial analysis or uh, text mining or uh, data mining. So there were four specializations. They decided which one to go to. And, uh, and I'm talking about every week apart from their full-time job they uh, engaged in those lectures that for me is still something that I'm really happy about. This was a completely free course. And we had from the 43 people that joined, we had almost that amount that finished. So I'm one of the main uh, weaknesses, I think, of the uh, courses for Coursera and for all these platforms is that you register, but you don't finish because many are free. And then you think, okay, I can drop out. But in this case, the, it was free. They had their full-time job. They were from all over the place. So really it was not easy to have a schedule that will fit all of them, but they kept joining us. And that was really satisfying for us. And in the end, what was also a good was that they were put into a, a, to a point where they could bring a project that was actually going to be useful to work on to bring back to their organization. So they brought their data or some brought their problem and also faced the issue of, I don't have data to work with. So let's help them solve that problem as well at, as much as we could. And I think that's also where the mentors really came into. So yeah, basically that's it. In the end, they were also satisfied to have learned but also to have worked on a project that they could bring back to their organization. Thank you so much, uh, Claudia. <laughs> we also shared this journey with you to also, uh, because this year we are going to have the fellowship and we are aiming to have like 100, 100 more than 100 participants. And uh, this is what we did last year. And we are making, of course, some changes, but we are always open for feedback and suggestions from you all as well, because I. I think we have so many participants now from the social sector here. So uh, this is just how we did it last year. So if you have any feedback, comments on how we can do things better, we are always uh, open to it. Um, we also learned, so we 
try to teach us a lot, but we also learn a lot from them, uh, to be uh, very honest and fair, and we can hear a bit from them today as well. So first we have uh, Jashwinder, he is working for Protsahan India Foundation, and they are uh, trying to eradicate uh, child abuse uh, uh, throughout India, so they are uh, working uh, predominantly in India right now, and uh, Jashwinder will take you through a bit of uh, Protsahan's journey into data and digital and how um, why and how and why he joined the academy and what key takeaways uh, he had. Over to you, uh, Jashwinder. Hi, Parvati. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, share a few slides if it's uh, if it's okay, Parvati. Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, please let me know when you can see my screen. All right. Okay. So. Uh, Protsahan is, uh, uh, if I'll, I'll give you a little brief about what we are doing. So Protsahan works directly at the grassroots uh, with the, some of the most marginalized segments of society in the urban slums of India, uh, with a focus on adolescent girls in the age group of 10 to 19 who've either survived or are at very high risk of abuse. Uh, we developed a model uh, for working with the girls to address adverse uh, childhood experiences that we call the heart model. Uh, which stands for health, education, art, uh, rights, and technology. Uh, arts for art-based therapy and life skills, rights and entitlements uh, that are available to them from the government social security systems, and technology as an enabler to uh, give them access to that. Now, this model is used in a three-phase uh, intervention on the ground, which is rescue, uh, continuum of care, and linkages to the social security systems instituted by the government. Uh, like Professor Dick Den Hertog says, uh, that uh, we need to be obsolete. Uh, so we believe in the same ideology that Protsahan should be obsolete for our uh, communities. Hence, uh, the linkages uh, to the government systems uh, becomes a very essential part uh, for our success. Uh, now, in this approach, that is uh, primarily led uh, by empathy towards the child, where it is imperative for us to listen to her more than uh, telling her what... Uh, uh, what to do, it is often difficult to measure the outcomes of the intervention at the grassroots. Um, how do you measure empathy or how uh, the impact of uh, the financial independence uh, uh, affects the life of a young girl? Because the impact uh, in this case is, is more than a mile wide and, and more than a mile deep at the same time for her. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, two sisters who came from a family of seven with, with a monthly income of about 8,000 rupees, which is about 100, less than 100 euros. Uh, and they enrolled for a seven-month uh, fellowship program with us after completing their school and having been with Prusahan for about uh, four years. Um, now, in school, they never learned about financial planning or acquired uh, any job-ready skills. Now, after the fellowship program, both are in jobs uh, making more than 20,000 rupees, which is approximately uh, 250 euros. Now, bringing the in, uh, family income up to about 600 euros a month, it, it may seem nothing, uh, but it's a huge, massive amount for a family living in the slums of India. Uh, now, with this added income, the family has moved from the slums to a rented house in a respectable neighborhood close to the workplace uh, for the two girls. And the girls have a very prominent say in, in the family's financial decisions uh, that, that no woman was accorded in, uh, in the past in the family. Now, they are not married uh, early, uh, and most of all, uh, there, there's a class shift and there's a mindset shift for the entire family. How do you measure that mindset shift? You know, that was something we were grappling with uh, uh, in, uh, in our data from the grassroots. And uh, uh, we were using Excel sheets uh, uh, from the beginning to measure the most basic data on, on each child who enrolled at Protsahan. Uh, but as we grew to support more than 80,000 girls in, eight, more, uh, in, in more than 85 slums in, in the city, uh, Excel sheets were becoming ineffective and, and it was riddled with uh, data integrity loss. So uh, call it divine intervention, because, but that's exactly when ABW and data.org happened for us. And uh, we, we took that uh, uh, data maturity uh, test and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, we were tampering with the idea of creating a web application for our team uh, that could help us measure uh, the impact of our work on the grassroots. But of course, we had very limited understanding of how to measure the right data points, how to analyze them, how to visualize them. So I'm very grateful for the fellowship, uh, for all the sessions uh, that Parvati and Margaret uh, made sure all of them were so perfectly planned. Uh, Professor Dick Den Hertog, Professor Bhatsimas, uh, 
and the, the, the whole cohort who asked the right questions that helped me look deeper into the, uh, data science as a discipline, because I, I don't have a background in data science. I'm, I'm, uh, I do have a background in technology, but never in data science. So, and of course, my mentor, uh, Dr. Cla uh, Claudia Oriana Rodriguez, uh, who helped me understand that the anecdotal data that we were collecting uh, from the past decade, that too had a very valuable uh, uh, insights for us uh, uh, to, to understand the impact uh, we had in the lives of our girls and uh, how their marriages were being delayed because they were being uh, uh, you know, enrolled in schools or uh, how they had better access to menstrual health and, and uh, uh, just reproductive uh, understanding of their reproductive rights, uh, how financial independence uh, was impacting their lives and, and uh, what was the impact of uh, uh, climate change uh, in, in the migration patterns that we were seeing in the slums. Uh, and how that was affecting the lives of the girls, because uh, in in any uh, adverse situation, girls and women eat the last and the least. That that was something that we had seen on the ground, and we were very uh, you know adamant on on finding out the uh, the, the actual uh, data sets to to figure out uh, how to bridge that uh, gap. You know and uh, just uh, as a as a, a point of note here that you know with the data that we uh, uh, with the understanding that we that I got from uh, uh, the fellowship that I took to my uh, team uh, between September 22 and now I think we uh, uh, the the last figures I checked we've unlocked approximately about eight million euro euros worth of uh, uh, government social security entitlements for our communities so with this new understanding of data. We're, we're not replacing the government, but we are creating pathways to access the rights and entitlements for our communities. And that was very, very critical for us. It was uh, more than mission critical for us. Um, and uh, just to add that, you know, today in, in uh, I think that was the second iteration of the application of the data application that we were uh, trying to build. Uh, in in uh, Today, we are, we are working very closely with Ernst & Young, uh, who have offered uh, to support the next iteration uh, and help us optimize our collection analysis and visualization to to help us become more agile and adaptable to a, uh, to an ever evolving situation on the ground. Now, the fellowship has been uh, you know very critical for me to just be able to uh, ask the right questions. You know, it has given us the perspective to uh, work better at the grassroots. It has given us the perspective to uh, become more. Uh, you know, uh, ad adaptable and adaptive to uh, give back the data to the community and uh, bring back uh, uh, impact and, and results for them rather than keep that data with us and figure out, you know, how to grow the organization. How about growing the communities? How about working with the communities directly and giving them back what the data uh, shows, what, what the data has in store for them? So that, I think, has been a very uh, crucial piece uh, for me uh, from the entire fellowship. Thank you, Deshwinder, for sharing this uh, story. So uh, like uh, Claudia already um, mentioned, it, the whole purpose of the fellowship was not to make every fellow a uh, data scientist or to make them all experts in artificial intelligence, but to give them a flavor of what is actually possible with these tools and techniques. And I think that's what we uh, hear also from uh, Jashwinder is that, okay, you uh, you get some inspiration from the fellowship. And then after that, you go and find uh, a sustainable solution and what works for your organization. And we are uh, happy to support uh, Protsahan also as part of our pro bono award. Uh, but there are many uh, uh, follow-up projects where which the fellows have initiated where we are not directly supporting, but we are hearing the stories back and I'm very uh, happy about. So that's uh, the uh, objective of this fellowship. Uh, thanks uh, again, uh, Jashwinder. Now we have uh, Dana and uh, she is going to also, she's also one of our uh, fellows. And thank you so much for joining. I'm sure it's pretty late <laughs> where she is right now, but uh, thanks Dana, over to you. Great, hi Parvati. Hi everyone, thanks for having me here. Let me also show my screen. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm one of the fellows of the first cohort of 
the fellowship. So I'll just share what we did for our organization and how it impacted us until now, um, like uh, months after the fellowship already. So my project circled around mapping digital divide for community-based strategy uh, in education. So I would just like to take a couple minutes of introducing my org that I as the beneficiary. So it's called Cada Career. So we're empowering the next generation of Filipino workers. It's an education technology platform that addresses uh, how we can get education to employment for around 20% of the youth that are underemployed or unemployed. Um, it also deals with or aims to touch uh, around 11 million Filipinos uh, who are underemployed and needing resources for their career development. So we do have the problem of these three gaps in that we're seeing in the people that we're serving. So there's a gap in exposure. So not knowing what to do after college. Um, and then there's a gap in network and also not knowing who to call or what are the opportunities that are unlocked after um, after they graduate. Because uh, most of the, the good opportunities that we are seeing are actually unlocked by a uh, uh, gate kept network network usually and lastly is a skill gap so after graduating unfortunately because of the trends in technology and also how we're seeing the acceleration of digital uh, careers the skill is quite lacking um, when they graduate and we would like to also address that so in Cata Career we do have um, these four C's that we are trying to address so we have coaches in our network to address uh, networking and also skills, but we also have content uh, for more of the exposure and also skills. But in terms of my project, it's more centered around community, which we're trying to bridge with my capstone project for the fellowship. And then lastly is concrete skills. So what we did for uh, my capstone project is from these, uh, so there's a start gap in, education and employment in the Philippines, as you can see in the first column. Um, and also for the next column, it shows the amount of digital divide or the lack of digital infrastructure in the Philippines. Around 75% of public schools here don't have internet at all in their universities, uh, especially also touching the, the homes in the regions that these students go after when they get home. So no internet in their schools and also likely in their so what we try to address uh, with the project is to try, of course, it, we're trying to build a platform, but there's a certain digital divide that will be the limit of our platform. So what we try to do is to identify certain hotspots of opportunities where we can build community-based solutions or interventions so that we can reach them in a uh, face-to-face or very hyper-localized setting. So from the fellowship, uh, this is the first time. So I came from a data background, uh, coming from also a software engineering background, but this is the first time I actually did hands-on for geospatial. So we tried to map uh, the digital divide in the Philippines, as you can see in the right, and also try to aggregate our data from our different interventions and programs for the first time um, in our nonprofit and try to see where we're reaching. So um, this will enable us to see what are the underserved uh, hotspots in the Philippines that we're still uh, opportunistic about and we still need to tap on. So I think the impact of the fellowship to me and my nonprofit team that I uh, also shared my work with is that it improved our data collection and culture. Um, it's not yet perfect, but it's uh, the first time that we actually tried to aggregate uh, most of our programs and try to make a centralized model that everyone can be uh, over, uh, collaborated on to. And then we also have a more proactive stance on communities now that we are seeing a stark gap in our reach. So before we're heavily reliant on organic, but now we're heavily investing in certain regions of the Philippines that we are trying to tap. 
And then lastly, it's going to be a more sustainable tool on surfacing the landscape. Um, in, so we do surveys in the past uh, where we survey our students, uh, the people that we work with, but of course, there's a, there's a lack in terms of the people that we are not really reaching um, don't even have the uh, visibility of those surveys. So this will also help us see in terms of population and also in terms of the infrastructure, what are the key regions that we're trying to get. Um, yeah, and then lastly would be uh, uh, key learnings. And so we also uh, very much value the data.org DMA as uh, Joanne mentioned before. It was really a effective communication tool that to communicate to my various stakeholders that we are we have data uh, and we are trying to um, use it, but we are not yet there in terms of investment and also the resources that we have. And then coming from an engineering heavy background, it was really good to see the frameworks that the wider Data for Good community is already using. Um, it opened up the floor for collaboration and also tapping into resources that are already there so that we can we don't need to do everything from scratch and also see the methods that work and be able to share my learnings also to the wider community was super important. And then lastly was a proactive solution and to really maximize the value and impact of the tool and also how we're strategizing. Of course, this is just a tool. We're also um, piloting another intervention. Um, actually this year it has started um, and about to roll out in the next months because of seeing um, a visual representation of, of our programs and what we're dealing with. So yeah, that's it. Thank you so much, uh, Dana. So uh, I think from uh, Dana's and uh, Jashwinder's presentation, you would have got a flavor of the diversity that we had to deal with because uh, she is coming from a very technical background, uh, software engineering. We have to keep her also interested in the program. It shouldn't be too boring for her, but also it should be uh, easy to understand for someone who is maybe new to data science, but have a technical background, but not really in software or in a data science. So uh, with that in mind, we had uh, developed this first, the fundamentals, which are like uh, not just data heavy, but also things, tools like the maturity assessment. Uh, we had a workshop on digital public goods by the UN Foundation. So we didn't just offer data science heavy courses, but also we had some frameworks and uh, tools that are being introduced as well. So I think uh, that was, uh, it's nice to hear that that also was positively uh, received. Um, now, as you heard, they did projects. They have used different types of data, like text, geospatial, some work with uh, uh, dashboarding, some with uh, more uh, analytics, but they all required mentoring to do their projects. And for this, uh, we had the support of uh, more than 10 partners, including we have today DHL and C-Motions, but we had also other organizations. But we would like to hear specifically, let's say from uh, Lutz, uh, first on, uh, so you have courses, right, that you offer uh, internally to the organization, but external, but how difficult was it to be tailored for, let's say, nonprofit kind of an audience, but also what kind of uh, learnings did you have throughout this process because uh, you had the training and the mentoring, like uh, how difficult was it to be tailored for public sector? Did you have any learnings, takeaways? We would like to hear yeah, that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, all right. Yeah, my name is Lutz. Um, so we uh, wanted to work with ABW last year and the, the, the fellowship was kind of the first opportunity was, yeah, we thought would be easy. Uh, and luckily, uh, at least what we provided was also easy. And we were uh, going with the greedy approach, right? Uh, what we could do, we can do and will do. Um, so what we offered were two trainings, and these trainings uh, are part of kind of our onboarding training for new joiners to our team, uh, where we kind of introduce them to all the technologies and methods that we use, uh, kind of the workflow that we have internally. And, and these are luckily um, very DHL unspecific, right? We don't use any internal data. We don't 
present them with any internal processes or strategic decisions that we can't share. Uh, so we basically just ran them as we do internally. So that is super easy. If you have, if you are part of a company or organization, if you know of these trainings, they are very easy to apply. Uh, I think they match the skill set also of the um, uh, of the people attending uh, quite well. Um, sadly, I wanted to bring our forecasting training uh, to to ABW. Uh, that was not happening. Uh, maybe there the big learning is. If your training heavily relies on an internally developed software package, <laughs> make sure that it's open sourced first. Um, we are still working on making that open source uh, because then I would love, uh, well, not I, because I'm not a trainer for, for that, but it's a three day, full day class. Um, so, yeah, that is, of course, then very difficult. Another challenge I see for maybe this year, I don't know how much we will work together on kind of the management trainings. Uh, I think they would be very valuable because DHL is maybe not too known as the expert data analytics company. Um, and so we are kind of the mold breakers internally. Uh, so we did need to, or still do, educate uh, our own managers. What can you do with data? How do you even identify that your problem you have could be solved with, with data? Because some people, uh, they think the computer is magic. Right, every problem can be solved with data, right? Uh, and now with ChatGPT, it's it's even more interesting what the ideas people can come up with. So we do have these trainings, but these also again uh, use examples that are very internal. So that will be the bigger challenge. Um, and then we also had a couple of people joining as mentors. Um, there, for me, the the learning is more. Uh, if you are an experienced data scientist even if you don't match the problem of the fellows, uh, you would probably be able to help them, right? Uh, so for example, I uh, helped someone who had a problem with Power BI. I don't know Power BI. Uh, I think I still managed to give some valuable hints and, and encouragements um, to start working on it um, because he didn't have data available. He wanted to create a Power BI dashboard for something where he didn't have the data. Um, so I said, well, Make up your own. It can be anything, uh, but at least you have something ready. As soon as you have the data, you can pull it in. You have done the first steps, and, and that will uh, make your journey ever so faster. Uh, and so, yeah, overall, it was a great experience for, for all the, the mentors. Um, the trainings that don't use internal data were easy to, to adapt. The others, they will be a bit more challenging, but uh, hopefully we can make it work. Thank you so much, uh, Lutz, for your brutal honesty, because this is exactly what we wanted to share with our community as well, that it's not all uh, roses and uh, flowers. It's always, uh, th there are challenges that have to be overcome. And this is also a huge learning for us that uh, mental matching have to be done um, a bit uh, in advance, maybe. Also, like, it is all not always easy to find uh, mentors for every problem. So then we have to be a bit more creative, like you said, like, uh, and there is not always data readily available. And sometimes the data cannot be used for fellowship because they don't want it to be shared. They don't want the results to be shared with mentors or be presented. So, um, yeah, we have to be creative and innovative when it comes to projects, uh, but also with uh, licensing because we want to make everything openly available. So these are things that we are now keeping in mind for this uh, cohort because that last year was our first one and we also learned a lot in the process. So uh, together, and one more thing that Lutz mentioned is on the project management. So we uh, this year we'll have the analytics translator course, which is for managers. So their um, courses such as what was offered actually last year uh, by DHL uh, will come into uh, play much more because yeah, it's a different audience to hands-on practitioners who want to learn tools and techniques. It's a different uh, set of trainings. So thank you so much uh, again. And uh, now we have uh, Mark from C-Motions who is going to uh, touch upon something a bit different. So we have a lot of organizations wanting to uh, collaborate, but why? 
I mean, they have a lot of work already. They are quite busy and they are uh, volunteering. Uh, they are offering their resources and time. So it's uh, not a small thing for us. We do value it a lot because we cannot work otherwise. So uh, I would like to also, um, uh, I know the answer, some of it, but <laughs> <laughs> I would like uh, Mark to also share it uh, with our community so we know uh, what motivates and uh, why uh, organizations uh, such as C-Motions are very much invested in this process. Would be a shame. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, perhaps a really quick introduction on uh, C Motions uh, for those who, of you who don't know C Motions. Um, at least as I see it, C Motions is basically this bunch of people, um, enthusiastic, uh, ambitious uh, professionals, um, basically a bunch of data geeks, I would say. Uh, working in all kinds of areas uh, with data um, with the uh, belief that we can create a better future uh, with data. Um, and we do so for... Yeah, thanks. Um, we do so for uh, commercial organizations, but also for uh, quite a lot of uh, nonprofit organizations. Uh, and we always try to use their own data uh, because we believe uh, there's a lot of interesting data uh, that every organization has, uh, which you can use to create a better future for yourself, uh, but also for, uh, especially with the nonprofit organizations for next generations uh, to come. Um, and, um, we have done this for quite a lot of uh, nonprofit organizations already in the past, uh, and we do so with consultancy, we do so with uh, interim assignments, uh, trainings, uh, but also creating data platforms uh, for them. Um, so all areas of data, data strategy, uh, but also really the implementation with dashboarding and, and data platforms, machine learning, whatever. Um, so analytics for a better world uh, really fits into this idea of uh, helping nonprofit organizations uh, and, and indeed creating a better future uh, together with them. Um, uh, for the last year, I guess the, the focus has been mainly on, uh, on training uh, sessions with uh, analytics for a better world uh, and on the mentor uh, mentorship. Um, so I, I would like to share a bit of my experience with the training sessions, uh, which has been my, uh, uh, together with quite a bunch of uh, colleagues of mine, uh, what we have been doing. Uh, we've been doing um, some machine learning and uh, Python uh, courses. Uh, and I've, uh, together with uh, some of my colleagues, uh, have been working on uh, business intelligence and uh, data visual visualization. Um, so, um, first of all, why are we doing this? Uh, of course, we are uh, working with a lot of uh, commercial companies as well, uh, also having assignments from non-profit organizations. Um, uh, and what we uh, notice is, uh, well, first of all, uh, with the uh, analytics for a better world, it becomes a lot easier for us, basically. Uh, so actually, for us, it's, I think you mentioned it as well, it's a relatively low effort uh, to make an impact uh, because Analytics for a Better World already, uh, of course, they are really into the data. Uh, that's their main focus and that's exactly what we are doing as well. Um, and they are providing basically the, the network of nonprofit organizations um, so we can focus on what we're good at, uh, doing smart things with data uh, and um, 
Analytics for a Better World makes it possible to uh, get in contact with all these nonprofit organizations. Um, and um, for us, this network, of course, uh, is important as well. Uh, so it's not just giving. <laughs> uh, we are getting a lot of it out of it as well, of course. Uh, this network is, is uh, extremely uh, well for us as well. Um, and, um, well, my personal experience, but also for, uh, for you, I guess, and also for a lot of uh, my, my colleagues, uh, it's just really um, motivating to uh, help other uh, people as well and to um, give something back, basically. Um, so uh, C-Motions, of course, is a commercial organization, um, but all employees really like to uh, have an impact as well, have a social impact as well, uh, positively. So, um, so that's one of the reasons as well. Um, and last but not least, um, it's a great learning experience for us as well. Um, and, and I will get back to that on the next slide, actually, where we see some of the challenges we have been facing, um, which has been very uh, learnful as well. Um, so my experience, um, and I've talked to my colleagues as well, of course, um, and, and we're pretty in line, um, is, uh, and I think it has been mentioned before today uh, already a couple of times, is that you are working with highly motivated uh, people. I must be honest, in my experience with training sessions for commercial uh, parties, uh, everyone is really motivated as well, of course, uh, because you are there to learn something new um, and you are trying to uh, find a way to, um, to uh, bring into practice what you are learning there. Uh, I do think the difference is that uh, in these nonprofit organizations, they are really intrinsically motivated uh, to indeed act out on what they have, uh, what you've tried to uh, teach them. Um, uh, but of course it comes with some additional challenges as well. Uh, the, I guess the international context um, with people, uh, participants from all over the world with different connection qualities, with different languages, different cultures, um, it has been uh, for all of our trainers actually quite a challenge to really have the interaction. Um, so uh, I think we're still figuring out how we can maximize this interaction where you can also um, find out whether people are, participants are uh, actually uh, keeping up the speed, keeping up with the speed that you're uh, trying to maintain. Um, so we've been trying different things with uh, polls online and, and uh, having them share their Power BI dashboards result, for example, uh, in the chat, stuff like that to, to figure out um, whether things are working. And I think uh, every session has been uh, recorded. Um, so also when they don't keep up speed, they can uh, later on uh, catch up basically. Um, so we're trying out different things, but uh, yeah, that, that's I think one of the main challenges uh, that, that we're facing. Um, but in the end, um, it's just really rewarding to, to give these uh, training sessions and to, uh, um, yeah, to have a positive impact. Thank you so much, uh, Mark. And uh, he said it's very rewarding. So we are this year we will have to double our uh, number of fellows. So we need more mentors, more trainers. So you are all welcome. <laughs> Let us know if you are interested to collaborate. We are always uh, looking for um, uh, more uh, collaborators. And uh, in addition, uh, we are also like uh, once the fellowship is over, like the fellow brings this ba knowledge back to the organization and we are getting a lot of uh, in-house training program requests coming in. For example, actually together with the C-Motions, we are now giving a Power BI training for AMREF. So within AMREF, uh, we are training a set of people. We are also designing a data visualization uh, bootcamp. So uh, 
from the fellowship, there are, uh, oh my goodness, here. <laughs> so from the, uh, the fellowship, we are actually expanding uh, the training network for within the organization as well. So I think with this, we conclude this panel as well. And we do have some time for Q&A, unlike the previous one that I moderated. So uh, <laughs> over to you for questions. Yes. Question, Maria, you mentioned um, that unlike Coursera, uh, that there's quite a high uh, sort of retention rate of, of people that follow the full program. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on why that is. So do you know what makes, because indeed, like you say, if it's a free program and Coursera is infamous, you know, people assign, but then they drop out halfway. So what do you think is the reason that that wasn't the case. Yeah, to be completely honest, I was surprised every week when the people <laughs> kept showing up <laughs> because I was honestly hoping at the beginning, like, I hope they come back and they kept coming back. And I, that was really rewarding for me. But I also realized, I don't know if it was that, uh, of course, they were motivated by the problems that they were uh, experiencing uh, back in their organizations because many, were still working with data, even though they didn't have the skills because probably they didn't have staff uh, to do so. So they had to face that challenge. So they were really interested. Uh -huh. I think they also felt uh, free to ask questions. I, I felt also, I don't know if you had the same experience, but in the, in the lectures I gave or um, in the ones I moderated, we had people making a lot of questions. So I guess, like they weren't uh, afraid of, oh, I, I will feel ashamed if I ask this question. Everyone asked and they then they felt comfortable and they kept coming back. So I think no pressure of uh, really finishing anything for a degree, mm -hmm. but actually I think also making them feel special. You know, that was also important, I think, because we made, made it clear since the beginning, look, this is an eight week program. Uh, we really are giving you the, the place here among so many applications. So please take it and value it. And I think they did. Uh, that's my opinion of it. And I'm really happy. I hope it happens again this year. <laughs> yeah. Project. Well, this question actually uh, raised my curiosity about something. Of course, that you described that there is some kind of intrinsic motivation, and I can imagine that 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 notion of bringing your own problem, like in the mentoring, also contributes to that. But my curiosity goes towards the selection that you have made. So you had a higher number of applicants than the ones that took the fellowship. Did you also take any criteria into account that will re would resonate with this amount of? Uh, let's say, a willingness to participate? Was that part of your criteria? That Would you measure it somehow? Yeah, so uh, we did ask them specifically in the form. Uh, we are having a lot of uh, applicants, so please do uh, make sure you are interested. Otherwise, please give your seat to someone else because it's uh, free, let them take it. But we also had a motivation letter, uh, a video uh, interview, like they had to record a video and send it. And uh, in from the initial uh, 340, we uh, first made a subset. Then we asked them to fill a very detailed survey and many of them didn't fill it. Uh, because it was very detailed, like we asked for this video, for example. Uh, so there were uh, different steps to actually come to this uh, 43. And uh, I think uh, this year we will follow a similar approach that maybe we are not going to do all the applications at once, but we'll have two or three stage process. And this year we are also going to involve our partners in the screening process, like maybe create a panel because um, this year we uh, didn't open for applications, but already we have received, uh, Claudia knows the last count, but in our uh, subscribers list for Academy, we already have uh, around 50 uh, uh, people who are interested. So I think this year we, we are expecting and hoping for more applications. So we'll create kind of a panel and then we'll uh, do the process. But maybe that is also one criteria, but we are not uh, sure that that is uh, the reason for retention, but yeah, could be maybe one of the reasons. Thank you. Yes. It's me? Yes. Oh. <laughs> 
so I, I don't want you to disclose all the secrets, but uh, I'm I'm amazed of of the way you reached uh, so many people in so different parts of the world. So, do you have an idea how the word was spread so that you had those um, number of applications? Yeah, so we are one year old at this, at, and when the fellowship went live, we were not even uh, six months, seven months in. So uh, we were not very uh, known. But what we did is we reached out, for example, data.org and existing communities. Mm -hmm. So they shared it with their uh, in their newsletters. We had like uh, existing uh, clients of or Ortec also does a lot of outreach programs. So we uh, asked them. Uh, to send it to all the nonprofit network that they have. We have University of Amsterdam who uh, supported us in reaching out to a lot of researchers who are also working on research problems. And uh, if you, if we look at the distribution of applications, we see um, we get, got a lot of it from um, bigger organizations like Red Cross, World Food Program. So they had like more quantity and we received less uh, uh, let's say from smaller organizations, but the good thing was even these uh, big organizations like Red Cross and all have national societies. So we received a lot of applications from their country offices because uh, many of them have their headquarters here in the Netherlands and they are already maybe aware of data, but their country offices have, let's say, less accessibility uh, to these training programs. So that is also one way to uh, reach out, I think. So to uh, look at bigger organizations that have uh, more more uh, national or regional centers, so there uh, we can give them access as well. And um, we also struggled a bit with geographical distribution in terms of our applicants. Uh, so we received um, a lot from Africa and uh, Europe uh, compared to other regions, like even Asia was uh, not that much. We had a few, uh, but uh, when we made the selection, we tried to create like a, a, a good distribution, even though it is a bit biased. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we tried to do it in the selection process, but reaching out, we uh, tapped into the existing network. But this year we have uh, students like Martha, who is helping us with the outreach. Uh, we are going to uh, come up with some more innovative ways to reach out to more communities that may not be represented by these bigger uh, uh, groups as well. One brief question. Do you also take the time, the difference of time zones into account when scheduling the sessions? Yeah, we uh, scheduled it towards the end of the day, like three to five. So for example, for Jashwinder and Dana, I'm sure it was uh, late, uh, but uh, it was probably... Uh, uh, okay for Africa and Europe. So we did the best we could. Uh, maybe, but, yeah. maybe it would be an idea not to double it, yeah. but maybe to switch the, the, the time from year to year towards a more convenient for remote locations somehow. I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah because you said that people from Africa, which is more or less the same time zone in Europe, that could be related to a... Yeah. That's uh, yeah, true. I, I don't know. Yeah. But we also are thinking of some blended uh, approaches. So we'll have some recorded sessions, but we don't uh, want to be completely uh, uh, that much scalable. <laughs> Let's say we, we really like this uh, mentoring and this uh, touch points that we have. And the peer network is amazing because um, I visited Kenya and there were two fellows who didn't knew, knew each other. They are both working in Nairobi from two different organizations, but they are now doing a project together because they met during the fellowship. So uh, these kind of uh, interactions, we don't want to minimize by making it completely. Uh, uh, you don't want to be Coursera, right? No, there is no, no, right. That's, that's yeah. not the goal, exactly. <laughs> it's not the goal. <laughs> uh, so uh, we will think of some innovative ways to do it. And last year we had, uh, especially the optimization one where we had a lot of recorded sessions and notebooks shared earlier and the fellows were able to do it at their own slot. And then we had like one hour of session with the trainer to go through the results and then give feedback. So we are thinking of some uh, blended approaches. So that's actually a, a problem that became an advantage because I was slightly handicapped uh, at that moment. Yes. But apparently it turned out to become an advantage. Yeah. 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 Good to know. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Martha, do we have time for more questions? Um, 
because we are supposed to go downstairs to take a group picture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I can hear the questions. Maybe if I may ask a last one. Yeah. Based on your learnings from last year, what would you do differently the next one? <laughs> uh, actually, many things, uh, not one, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> not just because they were not right, but uh, because of the scale. Uh, we had 43 last time, and uh, it's not easy to double it uh, immediately. So uh, mentoring. So last year, we had a lot of one-to-one -one mentoring, uh, matching, uh, uh, how to do it a bit better. So we want to create learning communities. So for example, if four of them are doing a project on Power BI, uh, then a mentor uh, who is good in Power BI can support four of them. Uh, and they can form kind of a group. It's like intervisi almost. How do you say that in English? Like uh, when you have a group of people that are quite similar, they can also help each other. Exactly. So oh. it's a peer peer learning network. Yeah. Yeah. So we want to uh, try that instead of having one to one. Um, uh, Claudia can maybe elaborate a bit because last year we had uh, specialization and some specializations were more uh, attracted more people, whereas some the trainers were uh, equally prepared like the others, but they had, let's say, less number of participants compared to one. But that's mainly because of uh, the uh, technical uh, requirements. For example, if you want to learn optimization, uh, algorithms, then you need to uh, already have some background. But if it's business intelligence and Power BI specialization, it's easy for uh, somebody with a low barrier of entry. So we want to be a bit more um, effective in making these uh, specializations or groups. That's another thing. Um, anything else, uh, Claudia, that comes to your mind uh, now? Yeah, that, that is definitely one, the specializations, because we have 43 people and we offer uh, four specializations. Uh, but I think uh, business intelligence, if I'm not wrong, had, uh, oh, yes. a, a good, <laughs> had interest, but I was in the text analytics, text mining one. And I really, I uh, we all, of course, took the time to really invite speakers and they prepared and everything. And then I realized for one of the sessions, uh, I will have probably three people joining. And I was like uh, trying to invite others from other specializations where uh, the time didn't clash so that I didn't want the speaker to feel, uh, okay, I prepared and then three people show up. I think that was uncomfortable uh, trying to, okay, uh, I mean, in the end it worked out, people joined uh, from other specializations, but I think that was mostly because our expertise was, let's offer what we know, you know, like, but now in this case, we will offer also what they want to learn as well. So understand them better than we did last time. I think that's one of the big uh, learnings. And with the mentors, I think also, what will you do differently with them this year? Mentorship? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I did just say that that uh, you can probably help them, but ideally, of course, uh, having, for example, a bigger group, collective group, who have the same problem that is in your area of expertise, that, that could be very nice. Yeah. yeah. And no internal software, right? <laughs> and what do you think uh, Mark? yeah i think if you look at the training sessions uh what we have done now is quite a uh general um uh, introduction to uh to power bi to data visualization um if you would have more indeed knowledge on what they are looking for what the that, that also the trainers uh, know better what the exact problems are that uh, the partic participants are uh, facing um, that you can um, yeah how do you say that uh, define your uh, training session based on that now it was a, a rather general approach yeah.
and uh, this year we did some interviews with the uh, previous fellows, but also uh, they introduced us to people in their organization who are interested to do the fellowship. So we interviewed them to understand user personas uh, better, like what do they want to learn. Uh, the same for analytics translator course, so we interviewed managers at nonprofit to see what do they want to learn, like do they really want to learn Python, but most of them say no, of course. So we kind of made some questionnaire and try to get, gauge the uh, demand. So last year, maybe it was a um, bit less demand driven than we would have liked, but this year, yeah, we will try oh, to. That's how you learn, right? Yes, exactly. Then we are done because Martha is saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, thank you all so much, uh, Divine Lena Jashwinder as well, uh, for joining us. And uh, yeah, it's, it has been a pleasure meeting all of you as well. And we really look forward to collaborating with many of you as well during the this year's fellowship. Thank you so much.